Okay, in this video we'll take a look at some of the maps you guys submitted for your homework number two, and I've just randomly selected a handful of them from the homework submissions. Okay, here's our first one. So the first thing that I'm noticing about this one is that it's two different maps, and that's totally okay. So if you did more than one map, in part just because when you make it one complete map it gets huge and it's hard to display nicely in a file that you can share with another person that they can easily read it makes sense to split it up um, so you could do this either way so let's take a look at this first one it might be worth pausing to just sort of take a look at it yourself and take it in before listening to what i have to say because if you haven't already taken in the map then I'm going to be talking about a thing that you aren't familiar with, and it won't be very helpful. Okay, so a couple of comments on this. First and foremost, I'm seeing um, stuff that makes sense. I'm not expecting anybody's maps to be perfect or to demonstrate high levels of co-premise versus sub-premise versus um, independent premise, filling in implicit stuff, levels of skill. And so what I'm really looking for is just, do you kind of have, like, do I see the original argument reflected in the map? Is the right stuff kind of together? It's in the ballpark. Now it's just time to, like, tweak stuff. So that's the level that I'm hoping you guys are at. And I'm going to be giving feedback that would move you from that level to getting the more detailed advanced stuff right. Okay. So one thing I'm noticing about this one is that I am seeing something familiar here, these claims about soup and objections that, but not all soup fits these categories, whatever, right? Um, so that looks good. Here are the tweaks. One, you shouldn't have any questions in boxes. Um, in part, it'll be useful as we start making maps and, and, and doing more advanced stuff to be pretty strict about how we're mapping. There shouldn't be questions in boxes. Um, you can use sticky notes and whatever to add questions to your map or whatever, but there's a difference between the map of the argument, the underlying argument, and how that argument is communicated. And everything in the argument is technically a claim, a claim that is either the main claim or supports some other claim or undermines some claim or inference. Um, and then the other thing that I'm noticing is that in each of these cases, I, I think that it's very good that 4.5, 7, and 9 are included. They're just in the wrong spot. So if, let's look at just this one. Uh, it, soup, should be prepared hot. Objection. Gazpacho, a soup, is prepared cold. So that under, if this is true, and gazpacho is, you know, a bona fide legit soup, that would give us reason to think 3.5 is false. Now if something green is under it, that gives us a reason to think it's true. So cereal is baked when prepared as a cereal. Does that tell us that soup should be prepared hot? No. Um, so if we were to move this up as a co-premise, soup should be prepared hot, cereal is prepared hot, and then it seems like the inference would be, so cereal is soup. That wouldn't necessarily be a good inference, though, um, because, like, a baked potato is prepared hot as well. And that's think pretty clearly not soup. But we're not evaluating arguments. We're just trying to map the argument we've been given. Okay, and so similarly, um, we've got soup shouldn't be sweet. Here's some exceptions that would show this is not true. If this is under it, it should show that this is a reason for thinking this is true. If soup can be sweet, it allows cereal to be defined as soup. That's not a reason for thinking soup shouldn't be sweet. That would go up with soup shouldn't be sweet, and if it can be sweet, that like so i see why this person is wanting to put it here with the the blarbusopa because if that's a soup then it lets cereal in too but this hasn't quite captured the relationship between that it doesn't follow the reason rule so the thing to double check is does it follow the reason rule is this thing a reason for thinking that's true and that's going to be one of the number one things beginning mappers need to look at to give themselves feedback. Okay, again, you might want to just pause and sort of take it in 
because I'm going to talk about it. So again, I'm seeing a, another question, and one thing that beginning mappers are likely to do is sort of organize stuff topically rather than as a structured argument where things support other things, right? And so as an example, another case where we're not following the reason rule, but it's topically related here. So epistemology has many forms of defining the truth or what counts as a good guide to the truth, whatever. Consensus gentium is consensus of all the people. The fact that consensus gentium is consensus of all the people doesn't support this. This feels like a progression of ideas. And that's a perfectly good thing to do to have a map that captures a progression of ideas. You can use mind maps, just sort of general mapping features if you're mapping your argument and thinking about what progression of ideas you want. But when we're trying to capture the argument, reason rule, reason rule, reason rule. Okay, again, take a moment, pause, just sort of read through the map, take it in. I will say right up front, this is a good map. This one's really good. So pause it, check it out yourself. Okay, I'll assume you did that. This is great. Um, this is, I would be surprised if as many of them were as clearly laid out as this and followed the reason rule and identified co-premises and implicit premises as well as this one. Um, so let's sort of go through it and point out some of the things that are captured well here. So we've got the conclusion and starts with the definition of soup from the dictionary. Here's what it is and co-premise this definition doesn't disqualify cereal from being a soup. And those two things together are a reason for thinking cereal is, is soup, that this is false, that it's wrong, that it's not soup. The definition is this, and that counts cereal as soup. So then there's an objection, which comes later. You know, we get the dictionary stuff at the beginning of the piece, and then later she says that, well, dictionaries really aren't that helpful anyway. So here's an objection for thinking um, that we should accept this as our... So one slight technical change I would make is we're not undermining that this is in fact the definition. We're undermining the claim that we should go by this definition when we're deciding whether or not cereal is or isn't soup. Um, and then this 3.2 does support 2.2. So this branch looks great. We've got that first bit about the dictionaries and how that fits into the main claim. And then we have, here's all the stuff from section three, where she goes through and tries to come up with a definition that would count soups as soups and not included cereal, right? So um, there are some missing implicit co-premises here that are pretty straightforward to fill in. So a soup shouldn't be served hot. I mean, sorry, a soup should be served hot and it should be prepared hot and cereal is neither served nor prepared hot. That's the claim here. And if those things are true, cereal is not soup. But Here's an objection for thinking that, and here's the counterexamples for thinking that with the implicit premises that these are soups, right? So this looks great. This is mapped well. Um, soup is not a breakfast food, but now here's an interesting thing this person did that helps to sort of keep parts of the map together. You could have just put each one of these as objections under 2.5, so these would have all been red, but instead they put it they sort of categorized it. Soups are often consumed for breakfast and then gave positive support examples for that claim. So that makes sense. Um, shouldn't be served sweet. Counter example, which is a soup, undermines this claim. Okay, finally we're getting to the, the core argument that gets offered towards the end of the piece. Cereal is not a soup because most people think it isn't. One thing I'm noticing here, even though this branch generally looks good, one thing I'm noticing is that because is in this, which means there's something to unpack here. And in this case, I think it just ended up being a bit redundant um, because you've got most people think it isn't right here. So consensus gentium says if people agree on a thing, then that thing's true. And people agree that cereal's not a soup. So cereal's not a soup is true. So these two could have... Um, actually gone directly under the top, but, but like this is, this looks good. I think it's interesting that this person also included this 
And this, I think, the is sort of a complicated point that gets at, like, cereal's not soup, but it could be, and something where there's room for us to sort of dig in and um, engage with Joyner's argument, because she's got this, like, if you initially ask people, everybody is resistant to the idea that cereal is soup. But the minute you start sort of reasoning through basically all the sort of earlier stuff, people start to go like, oh, maybe it is a soup. And so she's confident she could convince people. And indeed, so in her, you know, we don't have her actual data, and I'm sure it wasn't a careful scientific survey, right? But she says the vast majority of people initially say cereal is not soup. But then after talking, here's the spread. And it's like 40% or no, and 30% or yes, and some percent or I don't know. Um, and so then it looks like maybe there's a case to be made that um, cereal is soup. Maybe people do come to think it is, or at least can be made to think it is. She says she's confident if she talks to him. So that's represented in here, and that makes sense. And then that last little bit from the conclusion, uh, which also supports that it's not soup. So unlike soups, I guess, if you if you take dry cereal out of its milk, it's still cereal. Whereas if you take all the bits out of soup, it's not soup anymore. So that tells you something about like, the cereal, I guess, wasn't soup. Uh, that's an interesting bit of argument. This looks great. Okay, here's another one. This one is simpler than the other two, and that's not necessarily an issue. It's not really a matter of... Um, there's a lot of ways to do it. If you really get the whole argument, it's definitely going to be more complex than this. Um, but it's not necessarily a bad thing if you really focus on just sort of the most important parts of an argument and sort of leave the detail out. The reason to map is to illuminate the argument, usually for a purpose, not to be pedantic. But since we're practicing our, our skills, it's worth trying to be pedantic to at least see if we can be. And then also, the more it's worth really carefully analyzing an argument, getting it captured right, reconstructed correctly, um, and the more, like, let's say, because we want to evaluate it, and that's what I'm going to ask you to do in your first paper, it does help to get it mapped as completely as possible because you're going to present it and, and be able to evaluate it carefully, right? Um, so how complex it is depends on your purposes, and simple isn't necessarily an issue, but for this assignment, I think I was expecting maybe a bit more complexity than this. So let's also take a look at what's done well here and where there's room for constructive feedback. So this branch over here is familiar. The soup, soups should be served hot, not for breakfast, and they're not sweet. And those are reasons for thinking cereal isn't a soup. And the other person had these as independent premises, and they, we can make sense of them as co-premises or independent premises, especially if you're, if you want to give the definition like, a soup should have all these criteria, then they would be co-premises, or if you're trying out like one at a time, it's not a big deal. The implicit premise here would be, and cereal isn't served hot, is a breakfast food, and is sweet. Right, so that's the implicit premise. The thing that I think should be in here, if you're going to include these, is the counterexamples, right? Those seem important. Um, then we've got the bit about the dictionary here. And what I'd say about this branch, and again, hopefully you can pause and sort of take it in yourself. What I'd say about this branch is it's topically, like all this stuff is on topic, but we haven't really captured the structure of re the argument. Like, there are three definitions, and writers are not the authority on what words mean. Therefore, cereal's not soup. It's not clear how these go together as an argument. This is more just sort of stuff that's on the same topic. And this one also doesn't follow the reason rule. So people don't think soup, it, cereal is a soup. It looks like, why not? Well, when I asked everybody, survey, whatever, the surveys, people said no. This seems like a reason for that. And then I tried to change their mind, maybe we got to yes, whatever, doesn't seem to support that people don't think it is. So I feel like they initially said no, but later they changed their minds. That doesn't support that. That feels like a progression of ideas.
And then this, so if this is an objection, the objection rule is just like the reason rule. If a reason is under something, it needs to give us a reason to think the thing above it is true. If an objection is under something, it undermines thinking that this is true. So the fact that things that come in bowls and that have liquids are generally soups doesn't undermine that food categories are constructs. Um, so how these fit together and how they connect to cereals and not soup is, is much more complicated than this. Um, okay, next. Okay, this one is interesting. So I haven't really taken the whole thing in yet. Again, you should pause and sort of take it in yourself. But what I'm noticing is I'm definitely seeing mapping skill and I'm seeing sort of an interesting way of putting it together. So one question you might have is, wow, everybody did it in such different ways. Is there a right answer? <laughs> and there are better and worse maps. There are genuine objective criteria for what counts as a representation of this argument. That being said, mapping like writing, say writing a summary, for example, mapping is a skilled intellectual creative activity. And so there is going to be more than one way to do it well. And I'm interested to, to look at this one more closely. So what I'm seeing up here is the core argument from section four. And it does generally follow mapping guidelines like co-premises and whatnot. So we've got cereals as soup, only if people think it is, and not if people don't. And the general consensus of the public is that no, cereal is not a soup. Therefore, cereal is not a soup. These are good. That's co-premises. Why think it's a soup only if people think it is? Well, according to this um, consensus gentium theory, and I'm not quite sure how if this is quite right, but it's, a, it's in the ballpark and the sort of connection between consensus gentium and the fact that uh, we're talking about what words mean and we are language users does go together. I'll say a bit more about that when we look at my map. So then we've got this other claim. The people say it's not soup. So if we're arguing for or against this, we are essentially saying like, what do people actually think, right? We're really focusing on what people actually think. So yes, people do think it's not a soup. Why, what's the support for that? I might have put these together, but this is fine. So according to a survey, the overwhelming majority said, no, cereal's not soup. Well, objection, after talking through that, people tend to change their minds. But objection to that, even so, 40% uh, still said no, and that is the largest percentage in this thing, right? So it looks like, you know, most people are saying no, and so there's some reason to think this is the general consensus. But then we have this objection. Yeah, but if I... So in fact, I wasn't able to change a lot of minds, but I'm convinced I could. The other thing that's sort of interesting here is that we're talking about initially people say no, but after reasoning with them, you can change their mind. What's the significance of that? Which one actually reflects how we use the, you know, so if just gut level, how do we use the word? What's our initial reaction? That's going to be no. So what is the significance of the thing? Like if I were to talk to enough people, does that undermine the fact that in general, the consensus is soup, cereal isn't soup? Um, there's an interesting question there, but in some on the face of it, straightforward way, this does seem like it would undermine it. And then this person fit all that stuff from earlier in the podcast into this objection to, is this the actual consensus? And I didn't think to put it here, but I totally get why this person did, and I think it's interesting. So um, I think that it would be interesting if you wanted to pause and look through this a bit, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. I think this, this map looks is interesting and good. Okay, here's our last map, and this one looks interesting too. So again, take a moment, pause, kind of read through the map. So this person has started with over here the core argument from section four. Cereal's not a soup. Why think that? The laws of consensus gentium. Um, I think there's room to sort of clarify the argument here, especially since this seems to have a bit of reasoning. Cereal is not soup is the conclusion and laws of consensus gentium is the reason why. But then this 
doesn't super clearly give the reasons why laws of consensus gentium. I just think there's room to unpack it here a bit more. But so the laws of consensus gentium state that um, general consensus is our guide to what soup is, and the consensus is that cereal is not soup. So I would say skip this middleman here and just put this directly under cereal is not soup. And why I think the general consensus is that survey. So this part is generally looks pretty good. And then the other part compared with the last map, this person has decided to put everything down here as an objection to the main claim, and then um, presumably include Joyner's responses. I'm not sure. We'll see when we get there. So nothing in the dictionary definition of soup rules out cereal being soup, and nothing about our sort of ordinary assumptions like she went through when we were trying to come up with the definition, none of that ruled out cereal being a soup. So one thing you might have got a sense of is that throughout the podcast, like she's trying to get to the conclusion that she wants, right? That cereal is not soup. So like she just knows it is. What's the argument that's going to get me there? And so this is sort of set up to be like, well, actually those first parts, right? Well, let's check the dictionary. Oh, that gives us the wrong conclusion. Let's try to come up with an argument. Oh, we can't. Um, so those things might be best organized as objections. Like, wait, maybe you should have concluded that cereal's not soup instead of going with um, consensus gentium. So why, what's the support or objections for this? Um, so one objection is like, no, consensus gentium is actually the best way to define soup. Even though that's true, this other route, that's the better way. And why? Um, because we're talking about soup and consensus gentium and food categories or whatever. There's something about food categories that just makes sense of this way of coming at the truth about what words mean slash food categories. That relationship could be spelled out a bit more, but I, I definitely see something thoughtful here. Um, support for this is that the definition doesn't exclude, here's the definition and it doesn't exclude cereal. So nothing in the definition says we shouldn't conclude that cereal is in fact soup. That looks good. Um, objection, people assume cereal is not a soup because soups are hot. Um, objection to that. I'm not sure if these make super clear sense as objections, but I'm not going to complain about it. I generally get the gist of how this is mapped here, and I say it looks pretty dang good. Okay, finally, I want to share my map. Okay, so I'll try to be brief in walking through how I mapped it, and then if you have already submitted your homework too, you will get a Canvas message with a link to this map that you can use, one, to self-assess your homework too, as well as to work on your homework three due next Tuesday where you're going to start evaluating this argument. Okay, so I put the conclusion as cereal is not soup, but it could be. And I, as I said in my little note in my template, I think that's important. She, you know, explicitly, do I have the passage here, right? So if we look at the actual passage, she says cereal is not soup, cereal is not soup. Those are the words that she used. But general uh, tip about making sense of a text the main idea isn't necessarily something you can highlight on the page. And if you want to communicate an argument and a main claim, it, it helps to make it something you can highlight on a page. It helps your reader a lot. But sometimes you have to figure out what's really the main claim in somebody's writing or speaking, especially if it's not super polished, right? And so I wanted, I picked this because there are two objections to her main claim that make sense. And one is the person who agrees it's not soup, but thinks like in principle, not for this consensus gentium reason, but in principle, it couldn't be soup. Um, and then there's also the people who think it is soup. So there's this claim, like the but it could be, I think is relevant. And it's also, I think, captured here it's only soup if people think it is, and it's not a soup if people think it's not. Like, it's it's open, and she says she thinks she could change people's minds. Anyway, so that's why I picked this as the main claim. Support for that. Whether or not cereal is, a, is or is not a soup depends on whether or not people think it is, and people don't think it is. 
but it is possible to get people to think it is. Why think? It depends on what people think. Well, if we accept the consent, the theory of consensus gentium, then it depends on what people think, and we should indeed accept this. And I made this um, a highlighted box just to indicate that it's a principle. So if we're going to start evaluating the argument, sometimes it's useful to look at, like, is this a principle or a descriptive fact or something like that. Okay, so that's that. Um, support for people don't think cereal is a soup, that's going to be the survey stuff. And I really simplified this. There's a lot more that you could have spelled out here, as we saw with some of the other maps we looked at. And likewise, it's possible to get people to think cereal is a soup. She gave some reasons for thinking that, that I just sort of just cut, kept as simple as I could while capturing the heart, the core of the argument. Okay, so after I mapped the core argument and I focused on, again, this bit of the text towards the end of section four, I went back and I looked at where the other stuff could have fit in. So one thing I wanted to add was more details about consensus gentium because there was this stuff here like, well, what exactly is it? And there's a potential objection. You know, it's not always like consulting the people is a good guide to the truth. It certainly isn't a guarantee, but something special about what words mean and food categories or something. So here's how I captured that. Now, this is the same argument. Everything that's blue was in the previous map and new stuff is black. Okay, so what exactly is the theory of consensus gentium? Like she says, it's consensus of all the people, but what's the theory? And here's a clear way of putting it. Common consensus is a good guide to the truth. If everyone agrees that a thing is good or true, then it probably is good or true. That's the claim here. Consensus is a good guide to what is true. We should accept this theory that this is a guide to deciding what to believe, figuring out what's true. Objection. Well, common consensus is not always a good guide to the truth. Example, everyone used to think the world was flat. Objectively, it is not flat. So that's a case where going with the consensus, would have, we would have got it wrong. And this is an objection to an inference that's true. But when it comes to what words mean, common consensus is a good guide to the truth. Why think that? Dictionary writers are historians who record how words are being used by us. So that's how I captured what she was saying in this section. Okay, next. Okay, so now we're on to the next section, and I need to figure out how to make it all fit. Some of my controls are hidden. So this is the same map as before, and stuff that's old is in blue here. And so I decided to call this branch of the argument true. The argument for cereal is not soup, but it could be. And I put in the reasoning from sections two and three as objections. One is an objection to cereal being soup uh, to the main claim, like, this is claim is false. Cereal is, in fact, soup. And then I put the other one as false. Cereal is not soup, and nor could it be. And I'm not convinced that this is the best way to interpret it. I liked the way that one of them earlier did, too. But I think it makes sense. So, objection. The dictionary leaves it open that cereal is soup. We should accept this dictionary definition. Why? But objection to that, no, a definition is not the end-all be-all of the true definition of soup. Well, I think that dictionary writers are historians. Um, so this, I think, makes sense as an objection and gets her point about this into why it was fine that we totally abandoned the fact that we got the wrong answer in the beginning of the podcast. Okay, then cereal is not soup and it couldn't be. So... I fit in, I gave you in my template this bit of the map, and here's where I put it. So I think the conclusion she comes to in section three is that it just isn't possible to exclude cereal from the soup category in a principled way. And I fit that in by sort of making up an objection that that would be an objection to. This could have also have just been support for the main claim. I think that would have made sense too, but I put it as... There is a definition, there's got to be a definition that excludes cereal from soup. 
in a principled way, and we should accept that definition, whatever it is. And her, I'm sorry, that's just not, you know, I was hoping that would be the case too, but it wasn't. It's just not possible to exclude cereal from soup in a principled way. And then hopefully this you're familiar with because it was in my template. Okay, so that's how I mapped it. And again, I will share this map by sending a link to it in an email after you have submitted your homework too. So be on the lookout for that. After watching this video, you should compare and contrast this map and some of the ones we looked at with your own attempt to map this and also identify any questions you have in comparing it. For example, like mine isn't as complex. How important is that? I tried to answer that earlier. Um, anything you noticed that I did and you're like, wait, I had to do that? Include that in your reflection. Don't hesitate to ask questions. Get this kind of stuff out of the way as early as possible. Okay, I hope that was helpful.